I'm good. Get to it. Page 92. The Kashrut of Honey and Related Products. You're going to talk about me this year? My middle name is Honey. And we're going to be talking about you. <laughs> okay. Another food ingredient that is the subject of halachic discussion is honey. Honey, of course, comes from bees, which are not kosher. Since there's a well-known halacha, kol tome tome, recorded in the Gemara and Bechoros, that any material that emerges from a non-kosher living being is also non-kosher, one should think that honey should not be kosher. But the same Gemara explains that nevertheless, honey is still kosher. Rav David Haber notes that one may purchase 100% pure honey without kosher certification. However, other types of honey may contain additives with non-kosher ingredients and do require kosher certification. And two explanations are given as to why honey should be kosher. Why is honey permitted? The, the bees go around, they pick up the nectar from flowers. It is placed, we're going to see, it's placed in a, in a sack in their, in their neck. And then eventually it's uh, excreted, but it doesn't come from their body. It's not. It's not. A, it's not something that's excreted from a gland made by the body. It's, it's, it remains external. The nectar is brought from a flower. It's stored, but not internalized by the bee, and then is is put back into the honeycomb um, for you know eventually for food during the winter. So therefore, it's not really yotze minatome because it, it it's not coming from the bee itself. That's the Tanakhama. Rabbi Yaakov Oymer, Achezetochlu, he calls Sheretzaov. This you can eat of winged creatures. Hmm. Remember, the word of in Chazal or in the in Torah, in Torah language does not mean, does not mean a bird. He won't let me hear the audio. Hello? Maybe he's press the right button. Hello, you can't hear? Hello, sir. Mario, can you make can you make sure that Allah is here? Right now, I'm in the middle of fresh fruits. Can you hear Alan? Fresh fruits. Alan, can you hear the shear? Oh, sound. Mario, for some reason, he's not hearing. Maybe his volume's down. Get your volume, Alan. Maybe log, out, log out and get back in. Mine, 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 you know, bird is a different than a reptile, which is different than a mammal. But but according to anything that flies is according to the Torah and Chazal, an oaf. A sheretz oaf is like an, a, a winged insect. So of these you can eat. Zeata ochel, v'yata ochel sheretz oaf tome. And you can't eat a, a sheretz oaf, which is tome. Frank the Gemara, sheretz oaf tome, badeksi. There's already a lav there. Ella sheretz of tome iata ochel, avata ochel masha of tome masha. It means you cannot eat a winged insect, but you may eat that which the winged insect excretes. Ve'eze zed zed vash dvorim. So according to Rabbi Yaakov, the permission for us to eat honey, even though it comes from a non-kosher source, is a pasuk. It's a gzeres akasuk. It's nothing to do with what the Tanakhama said, analyzing exactly how honey is made. It's nothing to do with that. It's a puzzle. Continues the Gemara. I might think that honey that is made out of wasps and out of some kind of grasshopper would be kosher. Amrit, look. 
We say no. Why, why logically, the rabbis are you allowing honey from a beer? Yet, honey that comes from wasps and grasshoppers are not permitted. Says the Gemara Marbani Dvash Vorim Shein Lo Shem Levoy. Dvash is Dvash. You don't call it Dvash Dvorim. The word Dvash generically means bee honey. But Umotse Ni Dvash Agizim Vatsin Sheesh Lo Shem Levoy. That's specifically called Dvash Sirim or Dvash Gizim. It's, it, it, the generic word Dvash doesn't refer to them. So that's why honey, bee honey is included and the other honey is not. So according to the first explanation of the Gemara, the reason that honey is permitted is because only substances actually produced by the body of a non-kosher animal are not kosher. But honey is simply the result of ingesting nectar and expelling it from the body. According to the second explanation, the permission of honey is based on a derivation from a posu. The Shulchan Aruch records the permission to consume honey without quoting either of the reasons. But it does add that it is permitted even if some of the bees' limbs are found inside the honey. This is your day of pay, Alan. Yeah, Ernie. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, the only, is that the only case where insect parts are allowed? I've never heard of such a thing. No. We're going to see. It's not so simple. Let's, Harold makes a good point. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Well, let's see what, from basis on what we've known already in your day, in our learning in your day, we know that a whole insect, a barrier, is of course going to be prohibited. And, and remember we learned that if a barrier, a complete creature, got fell into a mixture, we know there's no nullification by a barrier. Okay, but a, but a limb of a bee is not a barrier. <clears throat> so a limb, technically, if, if it was bittle, i.e. if there was more than 60 parts, just like a piece of chazer falls into a chulam. If there's 60 to one against the piece of chazer, then you'd be able to eat the mixture. Now, if you can identify the piece of chazer, you have, you'd have to remove it. You wouldn't, and therefore you have to take pains to strain it. But if it's a type of material that got absorbed in, it's, it's, for example, if you took ground beef, and you had ground beef of a novella, where you can't tell the difference. So that becomes, that becomes nullified in 16, you don't have to strain it. But if you, if you have something that's not kosher and it can be recognizable, so even though the rest of the taruvas can be eaten, you, if you can identify the piece, you have to remove it. It's only by liquids, for example, some milk, you don't have to remove it because liquid with liquid, you cannot separate the two, and therefore, there's, we use nullification. So technically, if the if you could if you could strain out Harold the the limb the limb of a bee or an insect, if you could strain it, then you would technically have to strain it. The rest of the taruvis would be able to be eaten, but you'd have to try to strain it and get rid of those pieces. Okay, but that brings up a question of invisibility. You know, there was this thing a while back where people with a microscope. Would look for bugs in the in the water. What's the rule? Is with naked eye? We, if I see a bee whisker with the naked eye, do I need a microscope to look for? Bee no, whisker? no, you don't need a micro. We learned that. We we, we learned yeah. that in your in a few volumes ago. Okay. We went through that. If if it's not if it can't be seen, but some of these like in New York, they, you could see it if you looked at the water. They, they were you could see it by the naked eye. They, they, it was a prohibition because you could see it. Well, they were if, it's very if it's microscopic, it would not be a problem. Harold? No, I was saying that they're Bernie's patients. They have very good eyesight. <laughs> no, but that one that they, in New York, that, that was, you can actually see it. It was, see, it was seen. Um, so the shock explains that even though food items are heated up together, they usually transfer taste to one another. In this case, the bees' body limbs themselves detract from the taste of the honey and do not render it forbidden. So we have our old friend Livgam. If the thing, if the if it's a if the bee part gives a bad flavor, then of course it doesn't prohibit. We know that. 
the body parts make it taste bad. The noise and time with gum mutter, like we learn in Simon Kuv Gimel in our, in your day. <clears throat> Rabbi Eliezer Melamed writes that although the beekeeper must nevertheless strain the honey to remove the body parts since they are still forbidden. Remember that goes back to what I taught tonight, the concept that if you can see the Dvar Isser, even though if the Taruvis, the remaining mixture is permitted because it's one in 60, it's one in, we're talking about a, a, a something where the flavor is good. It's not Livgam, let's say a piece of Chazer gives good flavor. <clears throat> so the flavor is not felt if there's 60 parts of heter against the one part isser. So you're not going to taste it. So the taste you've taken care of with bittel. So the remainder of the taruvis you may eat. But if you could identify the prohibited part, you have to get rid of it. That's a very important concept to understand in bittel. Bittel doesn't allow you to eat the part that got nullified if you can identify the nullified part. In cases where you can't identify because liquid to liquid, or it's some kind of ground beef, ground beef, you know, can't identify, then then it's then it's bottle and yeah. it's okay. Yeah, it's not, um... What was that? Okay. Well, yes, was, yeah. So at Vorim Srichel was Saginus Advash. The beekeepers have to strain it. The base of Fami Murabas Bidvash Dvorim Matot. Dead bees or a glaim, a haki gufa hemshot boim, lach asin and vash kosher. After you strain it, right, the flavor of the bee part either it's lived gum or it was nullified by 60, and it's not a problem. We saw above in the Gemara that there were two reasons given for permitting honey. There's actually a practical Allah difference between the two reasons. Whether the honey that comes from wasps and geese is kosher. According to the first reason, it would be kosher since the logic given applies to them too, meaning they only ingest the nectar, <clears throat> spit out the nectar. They don't, it doesn't come from their body. So based on this first svar of the Tanakama, the honey that comes from wasps would be permitted. According to the second reason, it would not be kosher since the pasuk is referring specifically to honey from bees. The Tzitz Eliezer expands on this. He held that the reason was like the Tanakama, which was a scientific reason, that the Rambam must have investigated what the bees do with the honey, right? The Rambam understood from his researches that honey does not come from the bee itself, and they gather it up from the grasses, and then they put it in their mouths, they sort of vomit it up into the honeycomb, and it was a way for the bees to store food so they would have it in the winter years when there's no flowers. So, is based on a posuk. It means if you relied on the Tanakama, you would permit honey from a wasp. Even though the honey that's secreted by a wasp isn't coming from his body either. So that's a nafkamina. Shulchan presents the primary approach is that of the Rambam, but then cites the Rosh as a secondary opinion. The Ramok comments, that in any event, this case of honey from wasp is not a common one, right? Says the Shukrar Dvasir and Vigijin Mutter. The Yesh shows the the Rosh Asers, the Agon, the Ramah, the Ena, the Ena, and the Shukrar Lach. We're in a club. In our day, we don't have wasp honey, so it's not a it's not a major issue. Okay, now we come to another subject called royal jelly. Another halachic difference between the two reasons is the status of royal jelly, a substance secreted by honeybees and sometimes marketed as a dietary supplement to humans. I'm reading the footnote. Royal jelly is a semi-bitter substance secreted by honeybees and used in the nutrition of bee larvae. Although it is only used for a short time for most bee larvae, it is used for larvae destined to be queen bees, 
for their entire period of development and allows them to lay up to 2,000 eggs per day. In addition, it causes queen bees to weigh twice as much as other bees and gives them a life expectancy of 40 times more than other bees. It has been thought that royal jelly likely contains significant health benefits given the changes that it causes in bees. However, after extensive research, the European Food Safety Authority and the FDA have concluded that there's not sufficiently conclusive evidence to support the claim that royal jelly is, is helpful. So our question is, is royal jelly kosher? Well, Yezer Wallenberg addresses this question at length and initially suggests that its status too should depend upon which reason the Gemara is accepted concerning the personality of honey. According to the reason that honey is not an excretion produced by the bee, but merely expressing, expelling the nectar ingested in a different form, royal jelly should be forbidden. Since it is a glandular secretion produced by a non-kosher insect. But according to the reason that is based on a puzzle, which says anything from a bee is kosher, royal jelly should be permitted since it too comes from a bee. Rav Waldenberg concludes that it should be entirely permitted since it is taken for medicinal purposes, is also mixed together with regular honey, such as royal jelly is only a small amount of the entire product. Says the Shil Tzitz Eliezer Nishati Nikama, I was asked by many people, or by a few people, helps people that are weak. Um, and makes them, you know, strong after they've been, after they've been weak. In order to understand the questions here. Atik Mashafir, same Bazaar Rav Agadol, Rav Svi Hirsch Khan, Rav Hirsch Cohen, or Khan, in the Torah journal Hamaor, in Tishrei Tafshin Yud Tet, which, which is uh, 1959. Al Mahut Mazon Ze, Umashi Yesh Ladunama. Vizela Shon Dvara. Bisharuti Bakayitz, I spent summer. In last summer, Baratzeno Akdosha, Bali Ade Kovitz Beshem Tevel Briut. I saw a booklet called Health and Nature. Uma Baodish Tobantil Mikrobo Ech Shemitz Dvorm Chadash. There's some kind of new juice from a bee, Beshem Mazon Malchut, royal jelly. Mishtam Shim Bobi Eretz Israel, the Tizonet Ha'am, the people in Israel use it. And no one questioned. Uh, that means people didn't clarify if it comes from the bee, why isn't it non kosher? So, Hasofer, the author, the Kovetz Aniskar, maybe Sham, Edad Kolachokrim Obale Mari, brings all the scientific evidence. Regeneration of It can make it's like a fountain of youth. And the government is supervising it, and the food is becoming widely available. Maybe the rabbis don't know about it. This food is coming from the stomach of the bee. It, le it leaves its body. It has nothing to do with honey. Honey is gathered from a separate containing sac near their neck and it's not produced from their body. As the dvorim collect the talamatok, shnofela prachim, the nectar from the flowers, with the kis katan shetachat gronan, they place it in a sack in their neck. To the end of kavartan, they bring it to their beehive. Umakino tosha, they vomit it up there. 
זאת אומרת שהדברים משוטטים על הפרחים, the bees fly on the flowers, ויון קויס נופת סוף הפרחים, they ingest the nectar, ומכניסות אותם לגופן, they מבצעות אותם הדבש מגופן, they don't create it from their body, they ingest it, אלא מה שמכניסות הן מוציאות בלי שום השתנות. That which they put into that sack, they spit out without any change. However, מזון המלכות הזה, ברור שאין לו מין דבש כלל, this is not a honey. לא מיץ פרחים ופרחים, זה לא דבר עם פלאור נפטר. רק איזה מיץ טבעי, שברק הקדוש ברוך הוא בין הדבורים, זה איזה מיץ נטרל פרודקט מייד בי הבי, משתמש בו לקיום המין, זה חשוב לדבר על פיוטר גנרציה של הביז, עד כאן לשון הרב הגודל. למדנו מסוגיית הגמרא סאז, רב אלדנברג, שבתאי מדי היתר של דבר דבורים, נחלקו תנקם רב יעקב. Tonight we learn the machlokas between the Tanakam and Rabbi Yaakov regarding why bee honey is permitted. Tanakam is soiber, shetamayatu mevnei shemachnis no tolu gufa and ve'enam latu tolu migufa. The Tanakam have believed in the scientific approach that bee honey was not coming from the body of the bee. L'achi mutu, therefore it's permitted. V'kei v'an tolu migufa ve'kom v'matzeh. V'fi zeh, mazon ha'machut shemitzayot ha'dvorim, this royal jelly, v'kei v'an shemitzayot ha'dvorim, v'kei v'an shemitzayot ha'dvorim, v'kei v'an shemitzayot ha'dvorim, v'kei v'an Technically, it should be prohibited. The Zilbas are time of Rav Yaakov, Rav Sheshes, the Koi Kavosek, the Sabi, the Lo Zeu Tama Eter. Okay, Rav Yaakov in the Mishnah, Rav Sheshes in the Gemara, who will help like him, that that's not the reason why Biyani is permitted. It's just a, a, a decree from the Torah. The Atta Ochel Masha of Tomi Masha, it's for Ezez at Vashvorim. Im Kain Lefi Divrem, Yesh Lahatir Maitam Gamma Zona Malchut. Says, says Rav Aldenberg, Zot Torah Ta'ola Lacha Mikol Amor Vamidbar B'Kundra Zedu Mutar. He says royal jelly should be permitted. L'fi Ani Yudaiti. L'kacha Trufa Zot Shal Mazon Malchut. Take this, this royal jelly. Hamu Urevet B'Dvash. He says, it's sold mixed with honey. Ha'ola Lav B'Kamoto B'Fi Shloshim B'Sheva. There are 37 times more honey than the royal jelly. Even for a chola not dangerous. Or to become strengthened. And make you young again. So the tshuva amadavar, written by Rav Amram Edre, regarding Questions asked of Mordechai Liyahu, the chief rabbi, addresses this issue, mentions the opinion of Shlom Zaman Abrach as well, who forbids this product unless one consumes less than a kazayas of it and the person is ill. It also mentions that Rav Mordechai Liyahu permitted it when mixed together with regular honey. Hashayla binyan kashut advash malchut yiduwa v'nivna yedei rabim poskim achonim kei matzad yichuva b'shem with Shlom Zaman Abrach sheishiv l'shilam akivan this is how we write. Rav Shloim Zamel. Ani as daiti, ein ani roi ashum nimok lahatir. He doesn't see a reason to make to say it's permitted. Rakem noy marsha mazon machut chashiv kisroch meikara, unless it's like noisim tam with gab, it's considered disgusting. Kivin shagam betchilas yitzilato me advara ein roi la adam meikara. Since the moment it comes out of the bee, it's not roi. Lo chalas ashum iser. If you don't eat it by itself, but he doesn't know for sure that this product, when it comes out of the bee, would be uh, inedible for people. It's clear that a a souring beverage does not cause a dry food to accept tumma, right? You, whenever you have a dry food, it's got to be machshul akabal tumma through beverage. As the Rambam taught us here. A liquid that comes out of your ear or your nose or in mashkin or machshirin, they are considered a beverage. Gamken Machshirim, Kumedumadu Kol Eilish is Karnoim Uusim Maod, 
Mitzan Atzman, seminal emission, liquid that comes out of your ear. It's disgusting. I feel emotionally with that cloud. She miyatsum hausum achal. You don't know where it came from. Vlachen la revo to lachatchila. To mix it lachatchila vat will talk advar shapir near lani as daiti de oser. You're not allowed to be mavatel lachatchila something that is oser. So he said you're not allowed to do it lachatchila. In din kot amazul market lo choshik kesruch mikarov. It's not considered sort of disgusting. He says, for a sick person, you could use it. Most people are eating less than the Kazayas, and they're eating it on Taruvis. Mr. to kill Tvei, he thinks it, you could be lenient. Mordechai also permitted in a mixture with honey. Does anybody eat this royal jelly? Anybody know about this royal jelly here? No. Must be something that's in, in Israel. Sounds like it's alternative medicine. The OU rules that royal jelly should be treated entirely as not kosher, based on the fact that it does not fulfill the criteria for the first reason the Gemara permitting honey. In addition, even if one accepts the pasuk as the source for permitting honey, royal jelly has a different appearance and texture would not be included. Unlike honey, royal jelly is a glandular secretion. Its color is a whitish yellow. Its consistency is creamier, less viscous than honey. Its taste is bitter, although not offensively so. Some have argued that royal jelly should be permitted because it's honey-like and presumably included in the scriptural exception as well. But this argument is difficult to support based on the two reasons cited by the more above. First of all, royal jelly is a glandular secretion, and therefore subject to the general rule that which comes from an impure being is also impure. Also, since it differs in appearance, taste, and function from honey, it should not be included in the scriptural exception granted to bees honey, since royal jelly can be considered a totally different food than honey. Others have contended that royal jelly is not considered fit for human consumption, as it is very bitter, and therefore not subject to any prohibition. This contention, however, is erroneous, for while royal jelly is indeed somewhat tart and bitter, it is by no means in inedible, this was confirmed by our Gentile tester. Therefore, people should be aware that royal jelly is not kosher, cannot be regarded in the same light as honey. I think, I think the purpose of going through this tshuva tonight is because it gives us a very nice, we see how they analyzed a new product. They used the Gomorrah from 2000 years before did it fit into the first shot and the second shot? And that's how they analyzed it. I think the analysis is really what, what is interesting for us. Although as we have seen, royal jelly that comes from bees is subject to dispute. There's another product that comes from bees that is permitted to eat, according to most post scheme, namely beeswax, which is used in products such as candles, cosmetics, and coatings for fruit. Despite the fact that like royal jelly, beeswax is a glandular secretion, it seems from many halachic sources that it was assumed to be permitted. This is evidence from the Mishnah of Avodazar. Elu mutorim b'achila. Cholov shechol v'goy. Milk that was milked by a Gentile. The Israel roe, as long as the Jew watches him. Vadvash, honey. And dav devaniot. Even though they drip, they're not considered a beverage to be Now, what is the meaning of the davdaniyot? According to the Rambam, the term davdaniyot refers to honeycombs, which contains beeswax. Says the parish on Mishnah Rambam, this is refers to the combs where honey is. Vavo pishehen notfos dover lach. They, it seeps something moist. Enanu oimrim shema zilef alayen yayin. 
We don't, we're not worried that this is wine. And this beverage is not machshir, to be kabbal tumah. Even though honey is machshir, this thing is called an oichel. It's considered a saw, not a liquid. You have to melt it and remove the honey. So the Gemara Shabbos refers to beeswax and states that the term shava is generally a reference to beeswax. Shava says, says uh, uh, the Gemara Psulta de Duvsha. It refers to beeswax. So the B'dikas HaMozen Kalocha says like this, Dvasha miyutsa yedea dvor mutra v'achilo. Honey that is made by bees is permitted. Wax that is made from bees is also permitted. He says, whenever the Chazal talk about Shava for, for wax, for candles, it's beeswax. Even though according to scientists, this wax is actually made inside the body of the bee. It seems that they permitted. He brings us a number of sources that it's permitted. Even though it's sitting there in the honeycomb. So the honey has been sort of soaking in this beeswax. And we know from what we've learned before, kavush kamavusha, soaking something for more than 24 hours is considered like cooking there. Now, if shava would be asur, when we talk shah Torah, tears at vash, because the Torah permitted vash, muchach shagama shava muters. It's a proof that the beeswax that the honey is soaking in must also be permitted. Hayereim vasmag, the Sefer Mitzvah's Godel, what if you boil the honey with the bees and bees parts that are there? We don't have to worry that it's prohibited. Because the bee parts gave bad taste and bad taste in the Taruvis is permitted. That if you boil the, the honeycomb to separate it from the wax, we're not concerned. If shava was prohibited and you're heating it up with the dvash, so it would all be prohibited because the nira, the noctor shava muter is another proof that it seems that the wax is permitted. The beeswax doesn't have its own independent taste. Cold time will be advash. It comes from the honey. Beeswax is permitted. Which is the, and that's the common practice. Wax is not a food. Nobody puts it into food to eat it. It's like a piece of dirt. The two major post scheme that we have. Okay, so that's regarding beeswax. Now, what about the kashrus of shellac, confectioner's glaze, and wax fruits and vegetables? Another ingredient found in food products has been the subject of halacha discussion, shellac. Shellac is a, re a resin that is secreted by a small beetle found in India, known as Caria laca, or the lac bug. These insects ingest sap from trees and then secrete it in the form of shellac, which attaches itself to the branches and hardens. It is then transformed through a complex process into confectioner's glaze, which is used to give food products a shine including many types of candies and fruits and vegetables. The question is, is shellac kosher? A number of contemporary posts have addressed this issue and have given conflicting rulings. Rav Moshe Feinstein rules leniently 
that shellac is considered kosher for four different reasons, some of which are closely related to the topics of honey and toothpaste that we discussed above. Let's read the Sigras Moshe in your day. It comes from worms that, that uh, ingest from sap of a tree. It's not produced from their body. They ingest it. When it comes out of the insect, it becomes hard in, in its in its interaction with the environment. The harvesters take it from the trees where it's wrapped around branches. With a refinery, right? And in a refinery, they heat it up. It becomes clear as water. They strain it so that there shouldn't be any parts of the insect remaining. And vein boshum tam. And there's no taste. This shellac has no taste in its natural form. Uma arvin otom im alcohol, right? They you mix it with alcohol. Be'er gimel dal chalokim alcohol bechelik echad shellac. Four parts alcohol, one part shellac. Umize nitin al candy, says Rav Moshe, put on candy, the chadom and bachutz, on the outside. Lolatam, el la mira zoar, it's sort of their shine. Shinasela candy, mitsukar, vaod minim, shea zor yamim rabbi, so that it should stay for a long time. Itzad shemakshe, and because the, the shellac hardens, maintains the shine. Vashak atzmo en bogam chazusa. It means you can't see the shellac. It's clear. Vinikra, confectioner's glaze. So I guess if you look on the ingredients of certain products, it'll say confectioner's glaze, or maybe it'll say shellac. Those that permit uh, honey from a wasp, which we saw that there were those who permitted it based on learning the Tanakama, Gamzeh Mutter. This would be permitted too based on that. Mishum Talil Lididu, Kol Kai Gabnet, Shem Kidvash Tvorim, Shem Imatzos Oisami Gufon. That if, it, if it's not produced within the body of the beetle, but it's just ingested, then that would be the same Svara to permit. Yesh Tan Gon Loimad Avram, Rav Yaakov Yemutra Shalat. Even Rav Yaakov, who we learned tonight, based it's on a pasuk, he says there, should, there would be a reason to permit the shellac. Because the lavush, halavush, the oil, the dover chidushu, the since this whole permission of honey is, a, is a, a novel sort of decree by the Torah, Amrina, Misvar, Shalo, Rifta, Tor, Lahatir, Ela, Dvash, Stoma, Shein, Derch, Lazki, Moshe, Demasheret. It's only going to include honey, which does not have an associated name associated with, like wasp honey. Aval the shalak, shalak min echad yeshavadai. There's only one type of shalak, and you don't mention the name of the insect. Yeshavadai insrich las kishem asher tamu bichlal drasha zude also oichel masha of tami mashvitz. It would be considered similar to to the to an a winged creature that is excreting something, but it doesn't produce it. Once it comes out to the air, it becomes hard like wood. Once it's like wood, you can't eat it. So it's not an oichel. So after a lot of processing, right, you have to, you have to melt it and then Till it's a liquid, and there's a whole and mix it with alcohol. So I read Yesh Medamus Zela Beitzat Nevela Utrefa Shenoila Bimena, then egg of a of a combination of a Nevela and a Trefa, and the chick that comes out of that Shemutamitam de Enafroch Notzam Na Beitzah 
right? First becomes an embryo and becomes sort of putrid, like it says in Torah, and that's how Shulchan Aruch Paskin. So he wants the same eat. So since the shellac started off as a hard piece of wood, and then you, so it's not a, it's not lemaisa and oichel anymore. And then you did even more processing. It says, it says it's similar to the egg of a nevela and a trefa hen, which when a chick is born from it, it's not, it's okay. Ah, after name is come usher. But even if we're going to say it's forbidden, he nay kivan shu dovershain botam. Doesn't have any taste below nitin latam. It doesn't add any taste. Already is batla barova alcohol shim is arivo. Four to one is certainly more than 50%. So it's, it, there's bitl baro, the dover shade and oisin tam. And if something that doesn't have flavor, ain't no oisin taruvo. So if something doesn't have flavor, it's never going to prohibit a mixture. Umitsad habe'en is bat, umitsad habe'en is batl baro, kimin shu numich ki nisa b'simik of dam, of damid. It doesn't give a taste. And it, it, it's nullified in the majority since it becomes dissolved. So if Moshe is mat here, what are the four reasons? According to Tanakama, honey is permitted because it's not produced by the bee, but rather it's a modified nectar. So the shellac resin is the same thing, modified tree sap. And even according to Rabbi Yaakov, who follows the opinion that there are grounds to say it's permitted since only honey that is an additional title, such as wasp honey is not kosher. But shellac is simply known as shellac without any reference to the non-kosher insect. Number three, the shellac is not a food substance and is not technically edible. And number four, it's bottled in the alcohol used to produce the food product. Dayan Weiss, right, the Minchas Yitzchak, was asked the same question, ruled leniently that shalak was permitted, although he acknowledges that he's not intimately familiar with the production, cannot rule definitively on the matter. You can see that Rav Moshe uh, investigated how this was made before he him. Me, can I interrupt her a second? Of um, course. I know the name shellac because uh, I remember it from my childhood. My the, my parents and adults always used to use it as a verb. You're shellacking something. You're putting a coating on something that's outdoors to preserve it. So I, I just uh, Googled it. And shellac is actually, its most common uh, commercial use today is a nail polish finisher that's put in nail polish to, to create a... a a sheen and also to keep it in place for an extended period of time. There you go. Well, obviously that's not eaten, no. but you see, apparently they, they would put shellac, this confectioner's glaze, many vegetable fruits and vegetables are coated with it to make it look shinier and look better. And, and I, I guess they made, they used it in candy manufacturing. I guess it's small enough in, in its uh, percentage of the candy that it doesn't uh, make, create a bitter taste. There's no, Rav Moshe said there's no taste at all. No. Okay. If you look at the ingredients on candy, you'll find carnauba wax is used to make it look shiny. Say that again, Saul. Carnauba wax. It's, it's similar to what you use on a car. That's what they use to, most of the time now to make candy look shiny. Where is that? But where? It, where no, it's where? not related to this. I'm just saying you will not find shellac in your ingredients, but you will find carnauba wax. Where is carnauba wax? How does from where does that have, originate? We don't know yet. I we have no know. idea. Okay, so it's not a biological product. I do not believe so. Okay. Again. It says here it's edible. Yeah, it's edible. Yeah, it's, we, it we, says we, a, yeah. Uh, Wikipedia says it's a wax of the leaves of the carnauba palm. So it's a it's a plant. It's it's wax comes from a plant. You mean the carnauba wax? Yes. Okay. So the chol datash v'shelat glaze hurak la la zika chazusa. It's only made for its appearance, but not nim alav amin shelat kadesh yach zikio tirzvan kanal harehu zev zegorim. So. It, it, it's two factors that create the product. One is permitted, one is forbidden. And we pass in Zevizek or Mutter. It becomes dry. It doesn't come from their body. Right? 
the Chazusa, the Zev is a Gorm Shari. It, at most, it would be an Isid Rabbonim. The Mikol Zayanir and Sotam Leteira, Hechadi Yefsha Binyan Acher. Ava Mikol Mokom Achmas I Bekiusi Ba'atzmi Betiv. He doesn't know how it's made. Lachain Yefsha Lilachli, Chavuz Daiti, Aloch Lamais. However, other posts can question the reasons for leniency given by these posts. For example, Rabbi Yoshev in Kovetz Chuvos rules that shellac is forbidden to use without discussing possible reasons why it may be permitted. Even though it may be inedible, why does he forbid it? Based on the fact that insects are always forbidden, even if they would be considered repugnant. Masha'enken hav sharut shal shrotzim secretions of insects, shayim atzmam gaminam ru'uyim lachilo, no, they're not roi lachilo, v'chozot asartem toimer, the Torah asert them, im kein gama yotzmeim doma l'shrotzim v'asurim avshenem roi lachilo. He says, that which is secreted by insects should remain forbidden, even if it's not edible. But if he's a nira da shalak, right, sheret shem v'rasham v'shchim peyrot k'deli noah, it's put on fruit to prevent them from spoiling, and to give them a shine. Osir, yim asheretz gam eno roi lachilo afidu leno yehudi. Even if the sheretz is not edible. So Rav Yashiv seems to be machmir. Rav Tzvi ben Ruven from the Kasharot organization understands from Rav Yashiv's ruling that he entirely disagreed with Rav Moshe's comparison between shellac and honey, as he does not even mention this as a consideration. Rav Yashiv he didn't agree with that comparison like Rav Moshe did. He never mentions any comparison between shellac and honey. There are scientific thoughts that there are chemical changes that occur when the beetle ingests a shellac, that it's not just like honey where it's not comes from the body, but it's just some kind of insect contribution to it. Rav Yirmiyahu Kaganav elaborates further on the reasons for those that disagree with Rav Moshe, which includes many of the Mahadrin Kajra's organizations in Israel who do not accept any of the reasons for leniency. To the best of my knowledge, none of the Mahadrin in Israel Hashem, accept shellac as kosher. They are not comfortable with any of the four reasons that form the base of Moshe's psaq. Aside from the fact that many opinions do not rule like the Tanakhama, but follow Rabbi Yaakov, they feel that the comparison between honey and shellac may not be accurate. Although the Gemara states that bees do not produce honey, it is unclear what factors define why honey remains kosher. Shellac is a complex product, and the lack definitely contributes to its production in a way that is different from the way a bee makes honey. It may be that even the Tanakhama would consider shellac to be non-kosher. How can we be certain that the reason that honey is permitted applies to shellac? Number one. Number two, there are two strong reasons why shellac should be non-kosher, even though the name of the non-kosher insect is not mentioned. And it should be prohibited like the honey produced by Gizn and Siri. The word shellac means the product of the lac insect. Thus, it does refer to the non-kosher origin. A second problem which Rav Moshe discusses is that Rabbi Yaakov der derives that honey is kosher from a drasha that permits products of flying creatures. However, the lack does not qualify as a share, it's an oath, a flying creature. And therefore, it's not obvious that shellac could be permitted based on the word zeh, which refers to flying creatures. Rav Moshe explains, kolayotzim and atome tome applies only when the non-kosher animal creates food, and that shellac is not food. However, others understand the Gemara's point in a different way. When an item deteriorates, such as an egg that eventually becomes a chick, it is no longer considered the result of the original non-kosher source. However, when no deterioration transpires, why should the atom not be considered the product of the original source? Shellac does not deteriorate during the process of being made from tree sap. Four, it is dissolved in several times its volume of alcohol before being applied, and therefore, the finished shellac is butter. That was Rav Moshe. However, this approach is problematic, as I mentioned above, after the shellac is applied, the alcohol is evaporated. The finished shellac that remains on a candy is almost pure shellac. That remaining on food is estimated about 80% shellac. This should not be allowed for bittel. So they really took Rav Moshe to task on this one. As mentioned above, this issue is relevant to shiny candy, 
as well as shiny fruits, especially apples, but others as well, and some vegetables. With regard to candies, most kosher organizations in the Gola follow the lenient ruling of Rav Feinstein, Rav Weiss. On the other hand, most Israeli Mahadrin follow the stringent opinion to prohibit. With regards to fruits and vegetables, the situation is a bit more complex due to other potentially problematic additives included in the wax, oleic acid, which is sometimes comes from animal extract. Due to the presence of shellac and these other issues, Rav Tzvi ben Ruven concludes that one who keeps a Mahadrin standard in Israel should be stringent not to buy imported wax fruits or remove the peel. Those that grow, the, those that, the, though those grown in Israel are not made with this and are permitted according to all. Says Rav Ruven Asheral Kane, Gabi Yishnama Matimetz Taruvada Kumrima Shonim, Vadai Shul Makpidim Al Ramat Kashrut Mehuder, those that rely on Mahadrin. They should not consume this coating. You should avoid like this. Only buy your fruits and vegetables from organic stores. Two. Although the ingredients in the coatings need not be reported, the presence of these coatings must be reported in the supermarkets. For example, in the markets, it'll say fruits and vegetables have been coated with food grade vegetable petroleum, beeswax, and or lac resin based wax or resin to maintain freshness. Or they'll say no fruits or vegetables have been coated with animal-based wax. So there might be signs attesting to this. Or you can peel a caliph of the pears for your by yesh chashel tzikui bayati. You can um, peel. They should, you should peel tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and sweet potatoes and almost every other fruit that has an edible peel. However, the North American Kashrut organization is generally lenient due to the fact that the majority of ingredients, including shellac, which they certify as kosher, are kosher. And it's often impossible to determine whether non-kosher ingredients are present. Rav David Heber in a start K in an article on the subject. What is the final verdict? Of course, the best case scenario would be to kosher certify all wax manufacturers to assure the kosher consumer beyond a shadow of a doubt that every component of the wax is 100% kosher. Since this is not the case, what should the consumer do? After analyzing all the information, we can arrive at the following conclusion. When one purchases waxed produce, it is extremely difficult to know which company manufactured the wax and what raw materials were used. Yet the overwhelming evidence proves to the fact, points to the fact that the raw materials used, both major and minor, were kosher in part. Although other possibilities could potentially exist, in circumstances where it is impossible to ascertain all the specific facts and the evidence heavily points to the kosher arena, Allah instructs us to follow the majority. This concept of Jewish law is known as going after the majority based on current manufacturing procedures. One therefore not need, need not be concerned with the vegetable, petroleum, and shellac-based waxes applied to fruits and vegetables. A similar position is taken by the OU in a brief discussion of the subject where they give you the footnote on the bottom for those that want to go through it. So um, I'm going to stop here because we come to a very classic machlokas regarding the kashrus of gelatin. And, and this, is gonna, this is a very famous machlokas, which exists until today. And, and we will, I think, save that for uh, next thing. And, I'll, and we will go through next week as well. There's an amendment called Further EU, and on page 117, which talks about whiskey, is whiskey kosher. Because since this crowd uh, drinks a lot of whiskey, <laughs> by Kiddushim, I think it's worthwhile going through that piece as well. So I'm going to say gelatin and whiskey for next week. We might get to the laws of Chinuch for children, but probably not.